and adult too. Adult dress the same way as, as the people of the world. And so we need to understand who we are. And we are Christian. And we must be recognized in, by our talking, by our action, and even by our dressing. Amen. And we are who we are, not to conform to the world. Amen. You see the world, we conform without even realizing it. We conform without realizing it. It's just like, now this is not obviously a wrong thing that I'm going to mention, but I'm just going to show you how we conform without realizing it. I did a little experiment at my church, and I had um, some little young kids and teenagers and adults um, standing in the front of the, the church, and I had, I had them, I said, they took all hands. See, the, the guys should hold the girl's hand, and men hold the lady's hand. And then I asked the, the church, what do they observe in the way they hold hands? And some got it, some didn't get it. The way that they, they, the young boys hold the young girl's hand, they, 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 the boy's hand were over the girl's hand. So they're holding the girl, their hands were on top of the girl. And every, all the male, they hold hand the same way. So I asked the congregation, when did they learn to hold hand this way? <laughs> when did the men learn to hold hands from the top? From the boy to the whole man, exactly the same way. I said, this is not the way in other cultures. They were, they were not born like that. In different culture, they hold hands differently. They greet differently. They do things differently, which means they were not born like that. Society. So in this society, we shake hands. In this society, men hold women hand from the top. And a woman will never hold a man's hand from the top. She tends to put her hand underneath, and he holds it on the top. You, next time when a guy holds your hand, see how he holds your hand. <laughs> so this is the way society, and that's not just wrong, but I'm going to show you that subtly we have, we, society influences the way we do things, the way we behave, the way we, look at how the Italian, I mean, greet. They greet different from how other people greet. So every boy, every girl in that society will greet the same way. Because society set a standard and we, and, we, and we behave that way without even realizing it. The same thing with bad behavior. You notice that in many societies, they don't have a lot of suicide. In our society, there's a lot of suicide. The moment a person gets frustrated with life, they want to kill himself. Because others have done the same thing. Others have done the same thing, so it becomes easy. The moment you become frustrated, that's what comes to your mind. Because on the media, it's happening every day. So we are subtly influenced by society because we don't know who we are. The moment you know who you are in Christ, society no longer defines you. And so that's the whole idea of conformity. We don't have to be the way other people are. Unless it's good. Then, so, here are some compliance. Compliance, you go to the next slide for me, please. So here we have destructive compliance. So a person can ask you a request, and you just do it. What are the chances a person, a person, a, a, a stranger, after service, a stranger meet you outside and, and say to you, can I, can I borrow your car for the rest of the day? And you said yes. Chances are very slim you will do that, right? Yeah. But you can under certain conditions. So this is called compliance. And people make you compliance and then you do anything for them. So here, compliance is changes in behavior resulting in a direct request from a person. A person actually requests and you just do it. So event move at a fast so Strong tendency to obey. So here's why we have a strong tendency to obey. Events move at a fast pace, giving the persons involved little chance to consider your option. So you don't have time to think. Requests appear at first to be quite simple and easy to do. Requests are gradual in nature. For example, so here's an example. Uh, let's go to the next slide first. So this is called foot in the door. That you got one foot in the door and you're almost inside already. So this is a two-step technique in which a person makes a small request and which opens the door for a larger request later on. So 
Step one, a small request you ask to do something quite easy, like give a hug or a kiss, and you comply. Step two, a larger request, like a request to have sex, you comply. How does this work? So here's how this works. This salespeople are taught how to do this. I had a, there was a, one Sunday, I had a vacuum, well, I didn't know the vacuum salesperson, but a salesperson came to my door on Sunday morning. And we had just bought a brand new vacuum for about a hundred bucks. And I didn't want to let this person into the house because I know the salesperson. And so my wife said, well, just let him in and you know, to respect him, then we can tell him we don't need anything. That was the first mistake. So we let this guy in, just to say we got a brand. So he said, he's a vacuum salesperson. The moment he says a vacuum salesperson, I know that we're done with him, because I'm going to show him a brand new vacuum. So he's, I, I said, I have a vacuum. I don't need a vacuum. He said, can I see your vacuum? And I showed him a vacuum. He said, oh, nice vacuum. That's all he said. Put my vacuum. He didn't disrespect it or anything. Then he said to me, um, I want to cook your time, all right? He said, but I want to demonstrate one thing to you. Can you show me a place in your house that is the cleanest place that you have in your house? That time I have four kids. My kids were, my kids were very young. I, and I said, so the cleanest place in my house, in my mind, was under my bed. So I pushed the bed away and he, and he vacuumed the bed. He run his vacuum once. And then he took out the filter and he showed me the filter and he said to me, now, now watch his technique. He said to me, this is what your kids are inhaling every night. And that was troubling to me because when I saw the filter, it was bad. So then he said to me, show me a place in your house that is the most dirtiest. So I took him to the front where the traffic was high and the carpet went right down. And he said, can you use your vacuum to, to vacuum that? So I used my vacuum, I rubbed when it several times and he didn't pick up much. He's, he said, okay, can I run my vacuum now? He run his vacuum. I, I could see the clean, you run it once, I could see the clean part. <laughs> so now, and he said, show me, can I run this on your curtain? And he running down my curtains and he took off all this stuff and then he keeps saying, this is what your kids are smoking in every night. And that, you know, if you're a parent, you're concerned about your health of your kids. Yeah. No, he didn't have to compare his vacuum with mine. I begin to compare his vacuum in my head with my vacuum. <laughs> So I'm saying now, so now I'm saying to him now, so I was convinced now that the vacuum could do anything. And I said to him now, so what is, what is the cause of the vacuum? <laughs> so he said, let us sit around your table. So I know it was expensive, so I was already now to say, you know what? I'm not ready to buy this vacuum. So when he told me that I pay a hundred bucks for my vacuum, and he said his vacuum was $4,000. <laughs> and, and that was years ago. That was about 25 years ago. What? I said, I'm sorry. My salary wasn't going up there. So I said, I, I am sorry, we, we, we're done here. I keep, I want, it's a good vacuum, but I keep my vacuum. And he said to me, all right, don't be so hasty. Tell me how much you can pay for this vacuum every month. I went very low, I said about 20 bucks. He said, make it 25. It's so easy for me, so easy. I ended up paying for that vacuum for over four years. <laughs> My first finance company. <laughs> four years. You see how slowly he got me? Yes. He talked about my kids. He showed me, he showed me the cleanest place, the dirtiest place. Notice how he got to my mind. I couldn't say no. Even though I paid a hundred bucks to four thousand bucks, I still bought it. He made me compliant to him. I had to say yes. Because he talked about my kids. And I was concerned about the health of my children. And he got me. He got me. So people have a way of getting you to do things that you don't want to do. Imagine this. You are at a supermarket. And you're paying for your grocery. And you're short maybe a dollar or 50 cent. And you look in your pocket and you're trying. And there's a long line there and you can't find a 50 cent. And you feel embarrassed to leave and to go to your car. So the next person in line says, no, it's okay, I'll cover that. You know, and the ask the person, what's your name? I say, I'm John, and whatever it is, that's it. The person covering your grocery for 25 or 50 cents. All right? Now, you are on this, so you see this guy, a month later, a month later, you're driving along, 
car break down, it's this guy on the road. Ordinarily, if it's another person in the path, but you remember this guy gave you 50 cents to stop, to give him a rider or whatever it is. You go to England, you go to England and you're in a store and here's this guy in the store buying something and he's short 20 bucks. Hmm. And you're there, you're gonna give him the 20 bucks if you have it. You become obligated to this person forever for 50 cents. You can never say no to this person. Hmm. Do you follow this? Yes. 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 So, so let's bring it closer down to our young folks. So you, you have a, a date, and you go out, and your friend says, well, uh, can I kiss you? Hmm. He says, no, I'm not ready for that yet, okay? So you kind of push a little bit more, so you kiss him. So now, he has one foot in the door, just like the salesman. He has one foot in the door. You know when a man kisses a woman, or physically touch a woman meaningfully, what happens to her brain? Her brain produces a hormone to create a bond between him and her. He can go home that night and forget about you, but you can't, you're not gonna forget about him. Because your brain is already locked. So the next time now, it's easier for him to move in closer to get something else. Because you've already, he has one foot in the door. He's like a salesman. And so it's easy now for him to move in. Harder for you to say no. Just like the person who gave you 50 cents when you wouldn't need it. Hmm. So compliance. It's, it works this way again. Let's say, for example, you're sitting on your on your pouch, porch in, um, at your house and your neighbor comes up to you and he says to you, um, Agent Mrs. Jones, um, me and my wife are going on an holiday um, next week. And so we would like if, to know if you could actually f just feed her cat while we're away. Tell us nothing. You say, of course. I'll feed your cat when you're away. And then the next day he comes up to you and says, I'm thanking you so much for you know helping us over the cat, but you know, we've been taking care of our lawns you know for the past few years and can you really water our lawn or cut our lawn while we're away? <laughs> Guarantee you're not gonna say no. Then the day before we leave, he comes up and he said to you, I know we have pushed you, we have asked you so much favor, but can you pick up our mail for us? Hey. You cannot say no. For sure. He has got you, hook, line and sinker. For sure. You see how people make you compliant to them. The reason for that is that when you have established that you are that you are committed to something, it's hard to break that commitment. It's difficult. Why do you believe that some women live in a relationship are so abusive and they can't leave? Hmm. Understand how people make you uh, make you compliant to what they want. Now, the next is. The next kind of compliant is, we call it door in the face. It's the opposite of the first one. So now, a girl go with a guy, and the guy really um, don't want to have sex with the girl, and now he's not yet. But he wants, it's because it's his first time, first night, he wants to kiss her. But he's afraid that if he asks her, she may say no. So what he does, he asks her, can we make love? He knows she's gonna say no. He's gonna push, he's gonna say no, no. And then he's gonna say, okay, what about a kiss then? It'll be hard for her to say no because she has said no to the bigger part. Here's another rule again. A person, a person comes to you and says, can you give me a ride to, to Pickering? He says, no, it's too far, I can't go there. And push a little bit. Can you give me a ride to Pickering? I really need to get to Pickering. And the person said, no. And you said, no, I can't go to Pickering. And the person said, okay, what about the drop down from Toronto? And then here's what you say. Okay, why didn't you ask that first? That's where he wants to go. But if you had asked, you'd go to Toronto. And I said, no. 
Nice tricks. <laughs> so they ask you a larger request where you know you're going to turn it down. And when it comes to a smaller request, it'll be hard for you to say no. Hmm. Because you seem too unkind. Hmm. That's how people make you compliant. You don't know how the social world works. And so we get caught every single time. Because people are tricky. Just like Satan. It's his trick over and over and over again to get you to conform, to comply. And then you are like, and then we are like victims. We get into trouble and say, oh, I didn't really mean it. You didn't really mean it, but you're still responsible for the behavior. The people, Satan, is tricky. So let's go to the next one. So the positive side, so norm, the norm of reciprocity is a social trap. What would you do if a person comes to you and says, and smile and say good morning. What would you do in response? Smile back. You smile and say good morning. Smile back. Notice that. That's, that's nice and that's supposed to happen. But people can use this as a social trap. Reciprocity. If I give you something, you have a tendency to repay me in some way. Correct? Mm -hmm. A good favor prompts another good favor. But this is good, but it can also be a trap. Hmm. So, the positive side of reciprocity, it's, it leads us to feel obligated to repay others for acts of kindness. Now, if you smile at a member after service is over, and they don't smile back at you, the tendency for you to smile at them will decrease. Because that frown that it gives you is a punishment for your smile. So you feel like you're punished and you're not going to smile at that person again easily. Can they just punish you? But what if when you smile at them, they smile back at you? You're going to smile at them another time. And therefore from that moment, a friendship will develop. It's called reciprocity. You do something nice, I say hi, you say hi back. I say you've got a very nice hairstyle, you say something pleasant about me. And that leads to a friendship. But if you say something, if I say something nice to you and you say something bad back to me, you have punished my behavior and you are saying technically to me, stop that, don't ever say that nice thing to me again. And so I pass and I won't say hi. But this can also, it's good but it's also a negative side to it. It can lead us, it can be used to trap us into compliance. John does a favor for you and makes you obligated to him forever. Now you feel that you have to come to be compliant to him whenever he asks you to do something for him. Now, gangsters and drug dealers, they re you know how they recruit young boys and girls? So a drug dealer will drive up his nice car into a neighborhood and the time when kids are going to school and a drive up to a kid and say, how are you doing? You're going to school. Here's 20 bucks for your lunch today. So the kid take the 20 bucks, feel good about it. Next week, the guy drive up again, and we give him 50 bucks. Guy, the kid take it. The third week, he drive up and say, hey, I want you to do me a favor. The kid said, I can't do that. Hey, I remember I gave you money last week and the week before? Now the kid is trapped. I want you to take this package to school, and somebody will and give it to this guy. He's gonna be wearing a red, shirt or a red t-shirt, give this thing to him. It's drugs. But the kid is obligated now to do this favor because this guy had given him so much money and didn't even tell his parents about it. So he's at school, he's a big shot, spending money, but now you have to pay back. And this time now, slowly he's gonna be drawn into the drug dealing business. And his parents have no idea where you're getting money from. And they don't even care. They don't even see that he's buying English. He has a cell phone that he didn't, didn't have, didn't have somebody to get a cell phone from. You see this, and slowly this kid become a drug dealer because he was recruited. The same thing with, with, with people. They do nice things to you. Watch people who just, I mean, don't suspect everyone who does something nice to you. But don't be, don't be foolish either. 
especially if it's a, if it's if it's a, a person that you didn't expect to do those things for you. Okay. Now that being said, I don't want you to feel like you know you know ladies. If a guy come and smile at you, gonna frown at you. You feel that he is is after you for something. If you're a single girl and a guy smile at you and he seems nice, he smile back. You, you know, you, you don't want to be single all your life. <laughs> you know, men will smile at you if they if they have some interest in you. But I, you know, you, you have still to be careful in your selection. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Okay. So now, the next one I want to touch on is persuasion. A change in your attitude and behavior is a result of receiving a message. When a person is persuaded, he or she changes his or her behavior to match with the message they have, they, they come to accept. This is a form of complying too, and people persuade you without you realizing what they're doing until they get you. So the central, there are, there are two different routes to which a person can persuade you. One is called the central route, and one is called the peripheral route. In the central route, a person a person will say something to you, and you hear it, but you're not, you're not accepting it yet until you ask, you ask certain questions. So you ask questions of what the person is saying, even though, even though the person may be a doctor, he may be a lawyer, maybe a teacher, it doesn't matter who the person is. And they say something to you, and you're not quite sure about it, don't accept it until you ask questions. After you are satisfied that your questions are answered, then, but here is the peripheral route. The, so the peripheral route is that the person makes you feel good in what they say. They story you, they stimulate you. Like, you know, some church, you go some church and they just, they, just, they make you feel happy, they make you feel they stimulate you, and they stimulate you, and they can get anything from you. Because you're not hearing the message, you're just giving into your feelings. And so the message makes you feel good, it stirs your emotion. It makes you feel good, and you don't realize that this is a con artist. He's making you, or she's making you feel good, and then they can get anything from you. Just like Jim Jones, and what he did to the people, over almost a thousand people. He, he, he persuaded them to believe his message, and the people just believed because they were just stimulated, and that just made, because when you're emotional, you don't do anything when you're emotional. And people get into the right emotion, they get anything from you. Mm. They get anything from you. So, so that's a peripheral route. People are not critical thinkers. They just go with, they feel it. But if you must receive something from someone, don't be afraid to ask questions. Ask questions until you're satisfied that your questions have been answered. Then you can reject or believe. Okay, so I am going to go to this. If you can go to the next, go down, I'll tell you when to start. Go down, go down, go down, skip these ones. Go down. Okay, so here's how you resist all what I have talked about. Here are some ways to resist it. Always remember that total submission to anything except God is inappropriate. Let me say that one more time. Always remember that total submission to anything or anyone is inappropriate unless that is God. We totally submit to God alone because He's our Creator. We don't totally 100% submit to anyone, only to God. Reserve the right to ask questions and to maintain your own individuality. That, and even when you're married, you're, you're, you are yourself, but that self is shared with your spouse. Mm. You still remain who you are. Mm. If you give up who you are, then you become so, so under submissive that you don't know yourself each other in any way. A man and a woman, when they're married, they're two separate persons who have become one. But you're still you, and he's still him. He still has his idea. And you have your ideas, and you have to blend those ideas together for it to work. But if you said, okay, I'm all yours, and you said, I'm, 
do what will be as you feel. He comes in and he beats you. You have to be submissive to that. He does everything to you. Walk and you say, no, I'm submissive to you. Then only God, because God won't hurt you. So, you. so you have to understand, if a man says to you, go and do this and it's wrong, you don't have to do it. If your husband or your wife wants you to do something that is wrong, you can't submit to anyone who wants you to disobey God. Amen. So there's something, total submission, you submit to your husband or to your wife when they do something, when they are right in the eyes of God. Mm. And when they say something and it's right, you obey that because it's God who have wanted you to do that. But if a person is wrong and wants you to do something wrong, it's just like a, a couple and the, the wife refuses from having sex with her husband in a certain way because she feels it was in a normal way. And he literally wanted to hurt her because she refuses. And, 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 I, and then she came and said, it's better to obey God than man. If that is wrong, and the Bible says it's wrong, then it's wrong. No matter who your husband is. Mm. You can't submit to evil from anyone. He has to obey God and be so low to God that you're so low to Him. So, so that's what I'm saying, that people will persuade you to do things that are wrong. You know that if somebody says to do something wrong, regardless of who that person is, you don't have to obey because you're going to be guilty. Mm -hmm. Even if a soldier at war and the captain told, tell him to murder another soldier, to kill is different from murdering. If he, if he captured his, an enemy, and the enemy has no weapon, and his, and his captain said, kill this man. If he kill him, it's murder. It's not an act of self-defense. The soldier has surrendered. He has no more weapon. So to kill him now is murder. And therefore, even if his captain says, kill him, he's an enemy. And if he does that, he can be court-martialed. Because that's wrong. Even though we can't tell him to do that. You are not to do anything that is against the law regards of who tell you to do it. Amen. So question the motive of people who try to tell you to do things that you feel is wrong. Increase awareness of the power of the situation. Because be careful of the situation you're finding because the situation can influence your behavior. Can make it hard for you to resist. So have a desire for individuality to be your own self and that nobody can control or manipulate you. Desire a de develop a desire to exert control over your life. You can make personal choices if it comes to, to that. Now develop your own social identity. Make sure you know what your values are, what is important to you. Identify what is really important to you. Education, family, work, church. What is important to you? And believe. Be sure about what you believe about yourself, about God, about family, about work, about life, about education. Self. Know who you are and maintain that identity regardless of, of the situation in which you find yourself. Know that the situation does not have to change who you are. Life, know how important your life is and strive to make it better. And the last slide, if you go to the last slide for me. So here is a picture of a, of a cat and a picture of a lion. Don't, what would you think if people it could be your parents, could be your parents, doesn't matter who it is. And they tell you, our school. So you go to school and you have this desire to become a teacher, a lawyer, or whatever that is. And the teacher says, well, I don't think you have it in you to be that. What would you believe? And even your parents, if the parents say, you know, if you say to your parents, mom, you know, I want to be this, I want to be a lawyer, I want to be this, and your parents says, I don't think you have it in you. I think you should do that. I think you should do that. And everybody seems to tell you what you should be and what you, who you are. 
I just come to view yourself as incompetent, you know, I'm not good at this, I'm not really that. I can never be this, I can never be that. Well, first. So the lion looks in a mirror and the lion, he lives in a forest and all his friends come to him and say, you're nothing but a cat. He said in a lion, you're nothing but a little cat. He's a lion. But now he looks in the mirror after hearing all of that from all of his friends. But he's a little cat. So, so he looks in the mirror and what he sees looking back at him is a little cat. So he roars and what he hears is a meow. He no longer hears his roar. He no, he no longer sees that he's a huge monster for, of an animal that to be feared. He sees himself as a cat simply because all his friends keep telling him you're nothing but a cat. Now, the cat. And all his friends tell him, man, you are a lion. Look at you. And he, and he shakes his head, look in the mirror, and what does he see? Lion. And when he meow, what does he hear? Now, now, the question is for you. When you look in the mirror, what looks back at you? What have you been told? What have people been telling you? And what do you see in the mirror? Will determine how you behave in life, how far you reach in life, and what you accomplish in life. What do you see in the mirror? You could be 10, you could be 70. What do you see in the mirror? Do you see who you want to be? Or do you see who people have been telling you who you are? That will determine how far you reach in life. So now, I'm going to switch to something else, and I want you to put up that for me, please. And uh, you can... Now, can I see the hands of all those who are married? Few of you have been married. Married? Single. Let me see all the hands of all those who would love to be in a relationship, married, and have a family. I see one person, two hands up. That's nice, wonderful. And the rest, and the rest don't have no desire to be in a relationship. Right? All right. So I'm going to try to speak to both those who are in a relationship. Oh, by the way, I have, I've been married for uh, 36 years. Wow. 36 years. Wow. And I have four kids. My, my, one of my daughters just got married a wow. couple weeks ago. Wow. And so when I got married, my wife was just 19. Wow. Very young. And uh, it's been many years now. Um, wow. I don't want to defeat my, 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 just my age. I'm not as young. <laughs> as, I'm not as young as I look. <laughs> So, living single is lessons and opportunities for unmarried Christians. Is there biblical instruction for people who are single? Single is a great time. Everybody was single before they got married. So now, in Genesis 2 and verse 18, it's a unique Bible text. Here's what he says. God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. No, he didn't say lonely. A person can be alone and not lonely. Amen. Loneliness is different from being alone. Amen. When you're lonely, you, you're sad. You're frustrated. You want someone in your life you can't get. You're lonely and you can get sick from loneliness. So... Here's what God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. Which means that he was alone, but he wasn't lonely because he, was, he, he wasn't complaining. Yep. Adam was not complaining. It was God who saw the situation. Yep. And God said, I'm gonna stop it. <laughs> but Adam was not alone. He yep. was not lonely rather. So here's what happened now. Why do you think God was concerned about man being alone? Who can answer that question? Why was God concerned that he was alone? Eh? Alright. Alright. Eh? 
that's a good, good, yes, a good response. Because God had placed in Adam abilities that could only come out if there was a woman with him. Yep. He was built with all those capacities, mm -hmm. but none of those capacity Can could emerge yep. unless he, he was in a relationship. He could not be a father by himself. Mm -hmm. He could not even be a leader by himself. He couldn't do, become a father with those a woman. And so God realized that when Adam looked around, Adam disappears of everything. Mm. And he recognized firstly that <laughs> there was none like him. That's important. That's true. His ability to recognize that the, the, the monkey and the ape was not, was not like him. So he couldn't pair with them. So we're going to find out what you can learn when you are single and the opportunities. Why did you think God felt it was good? It was not good to be alone for what I just said. In today's time, is it still not good for a woman or a man to be alone? Same thing. Every man should have a woman and every woman should have a man. Well, I know it's, it's Adam was only one man and he was only one woman. In today's world, you have more women than men. <laughs> in every church, you have more women than men. Every wow. church you go. That's sad, but true. And yet, more men are born more than women. More boy babies are born, but more men die than women. Well, most men go to war, dying wars. So, we want to find out what are some... So today's reality. More than 80 million single adults live in the United States. And maybe, maybe 30 million live in Canada. Or uh, maybe, well, Canada is only 30 million people. So maybe a good amount live in Canada also. 40% of the adult population is single. 40% of the population is single. More than 10% of adults will never marry. Because there's not enough people to go around, especially ladies. <laughs> More than, and some people want to live single, some people want to live in whatever relationship. More than 30% of married couples will end up divorced, leading to singleness again. Yep. Wow. So, here are some single demographics. On average, American and Canadians spend the majority of their adult life single. Singles make up 40% of the workforce. Singles purchase 40% of all homes. Approximately 50% of children in Canada and America live in single parent homes. I was grown up in a single parent home. So it's not too bad. What does it mean to be single? Singlehood. The relationship status in which an individual is not currently involved in a romantic relationship. And we talk about alone versus loneliness. Now, important question facing single Christian. If you were married, if you're a member of the opposite sex, would you want to marry? So if you were a member, for the ladies, if you're a guy, would you want to marry? Yes. And if there's guys, guys, if you're a girl, would you want to marry? Yes. All right. So now let's go back to Adam. When I just met my wife, and she was about 18, just out of high school. And when she was 19, decided that, well, I like her, I want to get married to her. So when I did, I went to her mother. I came to Canada when I was 24 years old. Mm. At this time, I hadn't, I have no, no high school education. I wasn't working. I had basically nothing. So, but I see this girl in church and I liked her. And I decided <laughs> I want to marry to her. So I, I said, okay, I'm gonna go to your mom and answer to for your hand in marriage. So so brave me, brave me went to her mother, and when I went there, all the family was there. <laughs> At this time I was I was um, I think twenty-five. So I went to her the whole family was there and I was nervous. So the mother was a spokesperson and she said, Okay, so you want to marry my daughter? And I said, Yep. She said, well, are you working? I said, no. She said, do you have a job? Line up. I said, no. And she says, what do you have to give my daughter? I said to her, I have, um, what did I say? Potential. 
The mother said to me, son, potential cannot put food on the table. Okay, disappointed, left, feeling embarrassed. So I said to her, well, I have a pl I have plans for my life. I plan to go back to school. I lay out my plan to her. It's important that a guy have vision. Mm. A woman love a man with vision. A man does not vision. Yep. A woman will follow a man anywhere if he has if he knows where he's going. That's true. And so I sold that to my wife. Everything I want to be. I told her what I want to be, and um, and how I'm going to get there. And she was sold in it. So we decided to get married. I couldn't even afford a ring. I just. Well, my sister gave me some money and I bought her a little one. I think I paid 500 bucks for the ring. And she had, and she had about, she was working part-time for the bank after high school. So she had maybe about a seven dollar saver. So we used that to buy a little furniture because we said we're going to go on our home regardless. And so we decided to get married, set the date, and um, mother didn't show up. We only had seven people at the wedding. Wow. So we, in a big church, only seven of us, and then I decided to have a reception in my sister's um, sister's uh, living room. That was the little wedding. That was 36 years ago, by the way. Wow. And um, my God. Little by little, I got a job. Her brother got me a job at this place, and I work. And the money was too small. Back then, in the 80s, it was it was it was I was getting three bucks an hour. And then, so I and then and each year they give me 25 cent raise. So I sat with my young wife and I said. This time she, at this time now she had her first child. So I sat with her and I said, this is not what I want. This is not what I want. If I spend four years in this place, I'm gonna get one dollar for the four year age. So I'm gonna to decide to go back to school, but this I didn't have high school diploma. And so I want to go to college. So I, she said, yes, she agreed with me. So I said, so, so I was driving the bus one day and I see an ad and I took it down into an advertisement for a program at uh, a school called Different Institute of Technology. It sounds good to me, didn't know anything about what I was wanting to do. So I, so I applied to the school, and so they told me they wanted a transcript. That time they didn't have internet, so they did So I told them, I kind of bluffed my way into the school, they gave me a test, I passed it, sent the person on a test. So they said that they will, they will, they will give me an entrance into the program wait for my transcript to come, but the transcript never came because there was no transcript, really. <laughs> so, it was an engineering program, and I didn't know that. That's how naive I was. And I did, it was on mathematics. Engineering is on mathematics. And I said, oh my goodness. I was the oldest guy in the class. I was now about 27. Oldest guy in the class. And all the kids are fresh at the high school. They had their math back. I was struggling for the first week, second week. I was totally, I was totally out of it. Didn't know what to do. I told myself I couldn't go back to the factory. That was a no-no. I got to press through this. Didn't know what I was doing. So I decided to go to the library, get as much books as I can, math book, and teach myself mathematics. So by the, the, the end of the first semester, God helped me. I was on the dean's list. Wow. I was on the dean's list. I didn't. Know. I started knowing nothing, and by the end, of, so I graduated, got a job the first month, and then with those credits, I went back to more college and college, and I couldn't stop. So I had seven college diplomas. So wow. I decided, no, I have enough credit. Didn't need high school anymore. I'm going to go into university. I went to university when I was 39 years old, wow. and I had, and I had from my first university had a. I have two bachelors, four master's degree, and two PhDs. My God. This is what I said when I said I had potential to my wife. I sold it to her. And I said to her, I will give you anything you want. I'll buy you a beside her with a tiny little apartment. And I take a, I, I took a knife and make an X on the wall and said, I'm going to buy you a nice, beautiful home. Because you married to me when I had nothing. Yes. And so you see, even though God's word is that a man should have something to give his woman when he marries to her, but there's always exception. I was an exception. And when God made Adam and he put him in the garden, the first thing he gave him was a job. I wasn't lazy. It's just that 
the way my life was, it was, it was that I just didn't have the opportunity. And the moment I came to Canada and I saw the opportunity, I know what I could be and what I wanted to be. And so when God made Adam, the first thing he gave him was a job. That's true. And he gave him potential to become anything he wants to be. So I believe that when a woman meets a man, the first thing that you want to know, does this man have any ambition? Does he want to move from where he is? Does he have a desire to grow to become? What can he sell you? What does he see in his future? Does he have the motivation to reach there? Are we just satisfied with, with what he, where he is? God gave Adam a job. God, Adam loved what he was doing. So if a man doesn't want to work, the first thing a woman should do is leave that man. Don't, don't even decide to marry to him. If he depends on you for money, if he depends on you for money, he's always borrowing money from God doesn't want to work. He's jumping from one job to the other. That's a bad sign. So this is one way how God made us. Now when God made a woman, and I will say this to a man in respect to a woman, when God made a woman, he called her helper, help me. In Hebrew the word help me means Isa. When David write his psalm and he said God was his helper, it was actually said God was his Easer. Which means a woman standing in the place of God when it comes to a man, she's a Easer. And Easer is, this building is built with columns that holds up the roof. Without the column, you have no roof, the roof will cave in. Mm -hmm. This building is strong because it has several columns that runs through the building. The column is the Easer. The column is what holds up the roof. The man, the man can only fulfill his destiny as a man if he has a woman yep. who supports him. Yep. If uh, you know a good woman, if, if she supports the man's plans. Now, it doesn't mean that all the man's plans are good plans. Some of them have a lot of holes. But the woman helps him work through those holes make the plan become perfect. In other words, she breathed life into the plan. She's a life giver. She's yep. a life breather. Yep. So when he comes home and he says, well, you know what can kill a man if a man comes home with, a, with his ideas, the men are like that. I mean, guess what? I got this idea. And if she just shoot it down like that and make him feel stupid, you watch how he drift away from her. That's true. He will never come home with a plan anymore. You tell somebody your son. So a woman will never, never shoot down her husband or her uh, plan, or even her boyfriend plan, because he takes that. A man's desires, don't forget what I'm going to tell you now. It is, it is believed, but it is wrong to believe that a man's greatest need is for sex. That's not true. His greatest need is to be supported by his woman. If she does not support his dream or his vision, he slowly lose everything for her. Now, as I said before, is, is a man's vision may be full of holes, but he's motivated, he can't see the holes. So when a woman takes his plan and sits with him and says, honey, but you know, this should go here, that should go here, and she help him perfect the plan. They're, they're building a relationship together. I remember, and I can say, some of the reasons why my relationship lasts this long is I studied, I studied in, the, in the States, and I had to drive to Minneapolis and different Texas and different to different campuses. And I have my wife come with me. She took time off and she would drive with me. And in the nights, she would drive late at night. We were road driving hours upon hours. We stop. And, we could talk and build relationship and stuff like that. And when I gone to school, uh, you know, she gone shopping. <laughs> and for ladies to shop. So, so that over the years helped us to build a, a strong relationship. It doesn't mean we don't have issues, but we learned to build a strong relationship from, from she supporting me in my education. We'll sit down together and I tell her what I'm doing, where, I'm, where I want to go with this, and, and that support is there. And so that helps build. So when a man, when a woman tears down her husband's plan, even though it may not be greatest plan, you're not supposed to tear it down, you're supposed to help build it. That's why God made woman. The man is weak without the, without the man, without the woman. 
is not as strong. It looks strong, it seems strong, but his ideas has a lot of holes. And you put water in there, it runs out. But the man doesn't see that. He thinks it have it all right. When a woman comes along now, she sees holes upon holes upon holes. Her job is to try to help him to patch those holes so that his plant can be strong. Because if there is no Isa, the roof comes down. True. If there are Isas and there are no roof, then the rain comes in. So God meant for both of them to be together. So know what type of man you want in your life. And sometimes because we have grown up in a certain way, we think that the best man for us is, is, our, is, our, is the way our father was, or the best woman is the way our mother was. But you have to know what you want. Know what you're looking for. And know what the other person, know what you need to be. So what, when, when God made Adam, he prepared Adam for Eve, and he prepared Eve for Adam. Adam knew how to take care of a garden. So you can see a boy and you can know if he's going to be a considerate and a good husband. Notice how he takes care of his pet. Notice the love he gives to his pet. Does he treat them well? These are very important things you look for in a man. How does he treat you? How does he talk to you? Remember I said I've been married for 36 years. I have never once used a word I gave my wife a little name, right? A pet name that I like, I gave it to her. And I said to her when we got married, because I have never heard this in my entire life. In my entire life, I have, I have never used a, a foul language. Even before I was a Christian. I became a Christian when I was 15 years old. But I was kind of bad before that on the street. But I have never used a foul language. So when I got married my wife, I said to her, honey, we will not use any foul language in our home. And by foul language, I mean calling her stupid, idiot. For me, those things are foul language in my relationship. Yes. I said, how oh, you call by my name, I call it by your name. Even when we get upset, my wife used to call me, and for me, she used to call me Brother Duff. All right? When she got upset too, she used to call by my first name. So I know she's upset. Okay? <laughs> So I know, I know she's upset because she come my first name, but and when my kids came along, I, I sat look, like, we have meet with our kids every other every week and some every month. We have a family meeting. And I would say to my kids, in this house, no one must use these words. And these words are idiot, stupid, and whatever goes on the line. So you must never call each other. The boy must respect his sister, the sister must respect their brother. And you learn those respect in the home, you'll respect your spouses. A man should never look on a woman and call her anything but her name or something nice. Not anything to demean her character, neither would a, would a woman should do that to her husband. It slowly gets like a cancer. It eats away at the relationship little by little by little until they both lose respect for each other. And it begins with your little children. Watch how the boy treat his sisters. And watch how the sister treat the boy. They grow up, they treat their, their spouses exactly the same way. So in looking for a man, observe, go to his house, see how he treats his mother. See how he respects his mother. See how he talks to his sister. That's exactly how he's going to treat you. A boy must respect his mother. Speak to his mother with respect. A girl must respect her mother, respect her father. And you grow up and you find a man like that, no matter how he's upset with you, he's not going to demean you, he's not going to cuss you, he's not going to, he's not going to demean and belittle you with, with names. Because that hurts. That hurts. And then you're going to sleep with the same person you just degrade. That doesn't make any sense. And so in looking for a person, make sure and mothers who are training their boys to be husband and to be father, ensure that these characters are embedded in them so that they know how to respect and, and, and adore women. And women need to know how to respect and adore men. The next thing again is that a man must learn how to validate. Women love to be praised sure. for, for their person. That's true. <laughs> they love to be praised for their person. That's true. And a boys must learn to praise so true. <laughs> women. You look at a woman, a woman, most women take good care of themselves. 
they put a lot of effort and so they stay in the bathroom for so long. They have to make sure the hair is right. They have to make sure their face and there's no little spot on their face. It's covered with whatever they use to cover it. <laughs> Everything, they change clothes, make sure they're nice. And when they step out of that bathroom and their husband they didn't even see that. They didn't see the effort that they put in. That they have a new dress on, they have a new hairstyle on, they have it it, it takes away. And if a woman goes to church and they put on it, all they knew and nobody even noticed, <laughs> it's not good. So but men are different from women. You notice that most men, not all men, but most men, they will take their shoes off, their socks off, put it anywhere in the house. But a woman, she would, sit, she would be more concerned about her house. Why? Ask a woman why she wanted the house to be so tidy. She would say to you, what if anybody come in my house and would think I'm a, I'm a dirty person? But the man doesn't think that way. Because you see, the woman's house is an extension of who she is. But a man will wear the same shirt every day and because he's not concerned about what people see on him, most men. But when a man does something, his performance, what comes out of his hand? Notice how God make us. If a man, if your husband fixed the lock and you don't notice it, you spend an hour, two hours fixing that lock, you pass it, you don't say anything, he paints the house and you don't notice it, you watch later on, he's gonna bring it up and say, see, I paint because you didn't even see it. <laughs> that comes out of his hand. He get a promotion. He does a good job. You have to pay attention to that. Yes. And he needs to pay attention to you, to compliment you. So validation, you validate. You notice this. You have a little boy, and he's at home. He's playing and making his, he's making his little, whatever he's making, with his little blocks. And you call the little boy and say, come for dinner. He still sits here, playing with his little dog. He said, come here, son, I'm going to do this. He still say, I'm coming, mommy, I'm coming, mommy. And he's playing with his little blocks, building his stuff, carefully. So mommy comes and, and pull him away from that. He starts to cry. He goes into, the mom says, I want you to do this. He's upset. Let's fast forward now. This boy becomes a man. He's watching his game on TV. His wife comes and says, honey, go to the store and buy me this. He said, he said, I'm watching my game. She said, I don't want this. Notice now, when he was a boy, his mother showed no concern about what was being made with his hand. He was concerned about what he was making. His mother didn't concern. He becomes a man, he loves his game. His wife comes without no respect for what he's doing. Just command him to do something else. Watch his reaction. But what if the mother had come to the boy and said, Johnny, what are you making, Johnny? Oh, mama, making a house. I said, well, Johnny, you gotta come back to it after you do the chores. Just come to the chores and you come back. And your and mother complimenting on what he's doing. The boy will quickly get up, do what mommy says, and come back and finish. That's true. Now, fast forward, he's watching this game. The, the mother, the, the wife comes in and says, John, what are you watching? I'm watching this game. Well, it must be a great game, John. And compliment him for watching this game or whatever he's doing. I said, but honey, I really want this. Can you go and get this for me, please? Notice the difference. He will say, do you really, really want it now? And then you say, yes, honey, I really want it. I would have asked, I know your game is so important to you. You watch the reaction of that man. You laugh quick. But we don't know how to deal and treat each other. We want to command and demand and don't realize, don't respect what a person is doing. And so we destroy our relationship even before we start it. So how do you look for a person? You look for these things in, in individual, make sure that, because you, when you get married, nobody gets married because they want a divorce. You get married because you want to have a family, you want to be happy, but most times we're not prepared. We yourself are not prepared when we're single. You're, you're single is an opportunity to discover who you are to discover your skills, your ability, to develop as a woman, to develop as a man, to know yourself. So when someone comes into your life, they don't just take who you are, you know who you are. So I say to single people, it's okay to do things on your own. Go to dinner by yourself. Enjoy you, go on holiday. Find, just, just discover who you are and be happy with you. 
Because if you can't be happy with you, how do you expect somebody else to be happy with you? You don't like yourself. How do you expect somebody else to like yourself? Go out, look in the mirror and say, I love myself. This is good. And you go out with yourself. Go, go to dinner by yourself. You don't have to go out in a group. Once in a while you can. But take yourself out. And then when you're happy with you now, you expect others to be happy with you. Wow. So that's what God did with Adam. He made him first. He put him out here first to be by himself, to discover his skills, his ability, who he is, and that relationship with God. And now when a woman comes, he didn't take away his relationship with God. Mm -hmm. They played together. Yep. So God made a woman by herself, make him by himself and bring them together. Wow. So that's what God wants of us single people. Build, build a relationship with God firstly, so you can have the discerning spirit to see deception and to know who will fit best with you. That's the instruction for people who are single. So here are some opportunities of single women. Singleness is a time to learn and discover more about who in terms of your attitude and your personality, your spirituality and your purpose, your beliefs and your values, your strengths and your weaknesses, your goals and your ambition, your giftedness, and your ministry calling. Singleness is an opportunity to appreciate, enjoy, and fall in love with the world in terms of yourself, people, friends, nature, ministry, work, family, relationships, recreation activity. Singleness is an opportunity to evaluate your past, your present, future relationships. Where there where there are signs I ignore that were indicators that the person wasn't right for me. So you gotta watch these signs. Notice people and their behavior towards you because divorce begins at courtship. You ignore some of the signs that you see and think you can change a person. You cannot change anybody who don't want to be changed. And so look for signs of the person you want to be with. One of the first things that I looked for, because I grew up in the church from 15, I wanted a, I wanted a woman who, was, who, who loved the Lord, who was in church and who was spiritual. And when I saw this young lady and I saw how well, I, I wasn't even afraid to approach her. I thought she was too spiritual. <laughs> if, I go and say, if I go and say, I mean, can we go for a coffee? It's something that she will rebuke me. I literally, I literally was afraid because I thought that, man, that she didn't seem that she have any thought of any kind of stuff like relationship. So I was, so one day I was home one night and it was my birthday and my phone rang and she called me and she says, happy birthday. Oh. And, and for a guy, you know, that was a window. <laughs> she just called me to the loop, wished me happy birthday and I, and, and I was attracted to her in the first place. So I said, yeah, I, 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 I know I took the initiative and I asked her, well, I thank her and we have a conversation and I asked her, well, do you have any friends? And she knew what I mean when I said friends. She says, no. I said, but do you want a friend? And then she said, yes. And then I know the deal was done. <laughs> oh, <that's right. laughs> and I took it away from there on. I said, God, gotta take, the guy gotta know when, when, the, when the ship has landed and you need to take it away. We are still happy together. <laughs> right? And, and, uh, I know, I know. <laughs> and I have never loved anyone since. Hallelujah. I have never loved anyone more than I want. You know what? I remember that when I had nothing, she, she was willing to marry to me. And even though not even her mother came and but she was still in love with me. Amen. I could never, I could never let her down. Amen. And in fact, I was, we became very good friends, me and her mother, and I was there when she passed away. I became her best uh, son-in-law, you know, because I understood what she wanted. I understood that a mother cared for a daughter, and if a, if a man doesn't have anything, you're gonna be concerned, yep. you know? But um, I knew what I wanted, and my wife, understood what I wanted and we were willing to make to take that chance. Amen. And today we see that. So did I stay 
did I stay in a bad relationship too long? Now, if you're not married and you see the relationship is already bad, find out what's happening. It may not be the person, maybe you. Because many times we're in a bad relationship and we blame the other person. And it's really us. Alright? Now before I, 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 um, I wrap up, I want to talk a little about our spiritual growth and integrate that with a little bit about education. I am big on education and I'm big on spiritual growth. I believe that nothing should come before God. Nothing should come before Him. No relationship, money, career should not, nothing should take the place of God. Spiritual growth reflects on how we handle ourselves, how we handle problems and deal with situations. And I am big on education because I believe it's a leverage to get to where we want to go and to be who we want to be. When God gives us a mind and a brain, He gives it because He wants us to use it. God gave us two feet to give us all we need to exist in this life and plus He gives us His help and His spirit and His word. So I believe that every young people, every young person should go to school, should seek an education, should have a career. Now, people get married a little later, in their 20s and in their 30s. So by, so by, by 25, you should finish at least your first degree in university. But some people have it more difficult than others and you may not be able to do those things. But regardless of your age, you, can, you should still pursue education and a career. Especially for men. Women too in this life because one salary cannot pay the mortgage anymore. It's impossible to pay the mortgage for the car and for the house and one unless you're Donald Trump, unless you're a billionaire. <laughs> Most of us can't do that. So it's important that young men, that you go to school, you finish high school, and you pursue either college or university, and get your career or your trade. Don't forfeit school. Make sure that you have a good education. I started late. I started late, and it was hard for me, right? So you have an opportunity, and Canada is a place of opportunity when it comes to yes. education. You can go to school and, and work. You can do anything. And so, and young ladies, the same thing for you too. If, if you make a mistake, because some people make a mistake, they have a baby or whatever it is, don't let that stop you. Pick up yourself and say, you know what, I'm going to go back to school. Yes. And it doesn't matter your age, you do more benefit for the church. When you're working, you can support the church financially. When you have ability and skills, you can come back and use it in the church. You may have gone into administration. The, that, the church needs administrators. It needs accountants. It needs all those people to help to... The church is a business. It's like a business, a spiritual business. You have to handle money, administration. You have to do all of those things exactly like the business over here. But we need, they need church need people, educated people who can do these things. So you're benefiting the, 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 the church. You're, be, you're benefiting yourself and your own family. And for those of you who are a little older and you think you're too old to go back to school, that's wrong. That's wrong. You can go to school at any age you want. You could be 70 years old. I have a, a guy in my church, minister is over 70, and he's doing his master's degree. I had this young lady, she was, she was maybe 55 years old and she was trying to complete her for high school and it was difficult for her and I said I look at her work and I said no you, no, you could go you could go to college and the place she said she said to me but I can't finish high school I'm gonna go to college I said college and high school is different it's two different things and she went to college about two years later she did a three year three year program and she graduated with an A in honors wow so same person was struggling so you see, don't when God you make up for God's image, don't belittle yourself. Don't don't put yourself down because you feel that you're 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 not smart. Everybody's smart in their own way. Don't set yourself small because 
of the opportunities you didn't have when you were younger. I didn't have those opportunities. As I said, I didn't go to high school. When I came here and I saw the opportunities, I took it. I took the opportunities, right? And um, I don't work in a factory anymore. No. I became, I, I wanted to become a professor and I'm a professor of several different schools. So, and I have my own, my own clinic. So how did I do this? I didn't have high school. I took opportunities. Amen. I took opportunities and I used those opportunities. And so I am not encouraging you. And none of these opportunities that came my way allow me to, to put God down. I don't miss church. I'm always at church. When I was young and I was telling my I miss, I miss a worship day five times from I have been 15 years old. No matter what I have to study, no matter what I have, when I study continually, it has continued to my worship. Don't sacrifice your worship for anything. It tells God what your priorities are. That leads to different levels of sexuality. So, if you know you're not ready to be married to this person, be careful of that close interaction you have with them. It will lead to more than that. And you know